Praise the Lord, you've reached Pastor Persona. Let us go to the throne of grace. I love you. Father God, in the precious name of Jesus. For your mercy never fails. Oh, how we love you. Oh, my we are in you. I've been held we worship you. We adore you. From the moment that I we only bow before you. Until I lay my head. Reverencing oh, your holy and mighty name. Of the goodness. Acknowledging who you are. You are the God of mercy that are new every day. You are the God of faithfulness that far excels human ability. You are the God of knowledge that none can compare to. You are the God of wisdom. that is everlasting. You are the God of understanding that we can come to and receive from. You are God that reveals and make known your way and comforts in a time of comfort and assures in a time of assurance. Father, we thank you. Lord, we cry holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And Holy Spirit, we yield and we see thank you God thank you so much you mean more than life itself because you laid down your life A love that none can compare to. And assurance that no matter what may come, you are able to see us through. You can take all things and work it out for your good that will ultimately be our good because we love you and we will accept your will. For your will is excellent in all this way. And so, Father, we honor you. And we thank you just for being who you are. We would have no hope if we didn't have you. We would have no strength if we didn't have you. We would have no direction of assurance of a greater eternity if we didn't have you. And so we thank you for our life that is in you. And Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 This is probably going to be one of the most difficult messages I would have to share for this evening. I was reading several articles, and one of them 
was about a youth pastor, children's pastor, who was on the verge of being evicted. And for some reason, I don't know all the details of why he was being evicted. And he had five kids and a wife. And he was such in despair that he tried to kill his children and his wife to burn down the home because he felt it would be better if they were dead than to be homeless. This touched me particularly because he was a pastor. And many times people think that pastors don't go through difficult periods. They think that we as pastors have some type of destiny that prevents us from ever going through hardships and disappointments and trials and tribulations that are care in this world. When in reality, we deal with much more than you could ever see or understand. And it's not what you go through that determines your destiny. It's how you handle what you go through that determines your destiny. I don't know why he gave up on God. I don't know why he felt the need to take his children's life and his wife and his self the house on fire. I don't know the state of mind he was in and how long he was going through the ordeal. I, I don't know. He was an English teacher also. Because we know most children pastors, anybody working with kids, we understand most of the time they don't make nothing. You have to have other income because you're not really getting paid anything. Even when the government started giving out funds for kids, and many got interested in kids only because they thought it was a dollar sign. We know that the money is really not that great. And some places, so we don't understand all of his financial responsibility or what got to it. It didn't give us that. But that's neither here nor there. The point was, this was a pastor who could not deal with life circumstances. The reality is we all have been at a point in our life where we felt God had forsaken. We've all felt that Jesus on the cross experienced. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? We feel that his presence isn't there. We feel that he doesn't understand what we're going through. We feel that maybe he may not work it out. And some are able to get to that throne and shake off depression, shake off despair, shake off defeat, shake off disinherit, and allow God to see our way through. The Bible says that Despair is often associated with feelings of hopelessness, sadness, and distress. And there are many relevant verses in the Bible that gives us some of the psalmist's understanding of what they were going through. Psalms 42, 11 says, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thy in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my confidence in my God. Psalms 34, 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save as such as be of a contrite spirit. Psalm 40, 1 through 3. I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, 
and establish my going. He have put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Isaiah 41, 10, fear thy not, for I am with thee. Be not displayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with thy right hand of my righteousness. These verses offer words of encouragement and hope to individuals who may be experiencing despair. They emphasize turning to God for comfort, strength, and salvation during difficult times. It is important to read these verses in context and seek guidance from religious leaders or scholars for a deeper understanding of their meaning and application of your life. It is important to lay before God, pour out your heart at the altar to receive strength when you feel despair. You are never alone. And yet we have many clergy, ministers, church workers and leaders who have found themselves in positions of despair, financial despair. And the church can't always help. Because the many churches are not in the financial stability to be able to assist with those who may lose jobs, have health issues, or even pay their salary. And for some reason, people outside of the inner circle of staff are unaware of what goes on in the financial realm of the church. They have no reality of what really goes on in finance. Everybody don't have. Everybody cannot provide. The Bible says, bring all your tithes into the house, that there may be meat in my house, so that when things of this happen, the reciprocity will provide for those in the house of the Lord. That was the original organizational structure for the people of God to be blessed to put the funds in the house of God so that it will be used for the operation of the ministry in the house of God. All churches don't function that way. Some church functions on your colors, not on the word of God. Some put their faith and trust in things that God never gave for an organizational structure for you to put your faith in. And God only blesses his word that he upholds. And so when people may be in need, the church don't have. And there's no way they can go. I know I've worked at a place before and it looked good on the outside, but they were really not able to assist many. And everything you see, you don't always know the reality of truth. And it's not to be shared and it's not hidden. It just it is not anything to speak about. But then you'll have people to come to the church to take. They never give. They always take it, never given. And you'll have those who are givers, constantly giving of their time and of their resources and of their funds. And sometimes there's nothing to assist them when trials and tribulation comes. I don't know this person's situation, but I do know that that can happen and has happened in many churches where people gave to the church 
and did not have anyone to assist them in a time of need. God did not set up the church to operate that. It was designed for those who put into the church that when times come and funds were not available, that the church would be able to have funds to assist. That his house would have enough to assist with those in need. That everyone would assist one another. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Malachi 3.10. That there may be meat in my house. And prove me now. Herewith said the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. This is what God is saying. And God always honors his word. But we don't always honor God's word and how we handle resources and finance and how. If he was a pastor in good standing and he came into hardship and he's been laboring, that's his resource he's giving to the body. And whether he was receiving payment or not, he should have been able to receive some type of counseling and some type of relief. to assist them from being in despair. Sometimes we're so busy with our own personal agenda that we don't see people around us in the body of Christ hurting. We don't see it. We're too busy doing and engaging in things that has nothing to do with God. And we don't see the hurting of those who have labored and don't hate. We saw more of that with the pandemic. We saw even more when the government shuts down. See, many don't understand when there's a government shutdown and there's a furlough, many don't receive funds. Many government employees are in the body of Christ. And they will come to the church because they don't have. There's a fellow, they're not getting paid. And they have bills, monthly bills that's not going to stop because they don't receive a check. Government shutdown affects many government programs. And the more government programs you have in the church, the more it affects the finances when the funds are not put into the government programs in the church. Not just church, anywhere there's a government program. There's a lack. And many times there aren't money. And a lot of churches have been overly extended because of the pandemic, they've been providing for members from a resource that they had stored up and God had blessed them with through tithes and offering, but it has become almost depleted. And many pastors are laboring with very little, but they are thankful for what God has given. See, you have a group that looks at the church and thinks that the church is a hypocrite. They think the church is about taking. But many churches have provided over the years. But you don't know about that. And then you have people who rob God. They come just to take. They're never putting anything in. They just want to take. 
and destroy and devour the church. And when you don't keep continuously feeding them with funds, they will bad mouth the works of goodness that the church was doing. Because the adversary wants to destroy the church. It wants to destroy its funds. It wants to destroy its standards. It wants to destroy its unity. It wants to destroy the love and the glory and the wisdom of God. That the body would be for one another during times of good and bad, of lack and plentifulness. That was the original creation that no one would go without. That we would love one another, care for one another, pray for one another, and be there for one another as a body that loves the Lord. And not all in the body love the Lord. Not all come for God. Not all will labor for the Lord. They can't get a check. They won't be there. And when those who have labored for years with no check, if they get a check, my Lord, they'll keep up foolishness and act like they paying your bill. See, you have to know that when you labor for God, you're laboring for God and not for people. And even when you have these government shutdown that burst furloughs, it impacts your nutrition program for low income people. I didn't realize that. I'm learning that now more because of the pandemic. When the pandemic came, it showed a lot of schools were closed. And that's when it was made aware to the public that a lot of your nutrition programs were not available for these food to get to adults and kids. Not only so with nutrition, but even with jobs and gas. Some churches were helping out with gas. They were giving out gas cars so people could get to work. Because when you're furloughed, sometimes they were expected to work with no money and had no gas to even get to work and pay. More or less money to pay daycare or rent or mortgage or electric, or oil, or gas, or water bill. It affected so much. And while we are prospering, some are not. And some people are so concerned on self and have no compassion for the things of God. We should have the spirit of God to fast and pray and have compassion for others, whether we see them or not. And for those who think they're in great prosperity, you never know when you may end up in the same predicament as some other people. This man who had five kids and a wife that was about to be evicted and lost all hope and felt in despair. I've known people to have gotten to that level. And I've known places that could not assist. They didn't have it. 
However, the funds were spent, they didn't have it. And so people who worked on staff had to pull their personal funds together anonymously, confidentially to assist. And we never argued and complained because you never know when it could be you. How dare some people who say they love the Lord and they forget the love of God. People better put their faith and trust in the Lord. There are some churches that really do true ministry. Ministry that is needed in the body of Christ. We're not a government program. God doesn't want you dependent on programs. He wants you dependent on him, the body of Christ, how to live for Christ, how to save your resources as you prosper in the things that God allowed you to receive and how to give to the body of Christ that it will be multiplied. So when the world closes its hands on you, you still have God operating in your life. Nobody should have ever felt despair connected to the body of Christ. That was never designed that way for God. And this is not to say anything negative about the body of Christ he was attached to. Because not all places can function that way. A lot of them function on volunteer. And when you volunteer, you're using your money. You're taking money out of your household, taking it and putting it in the household of God to minister. And many times people don't see that. What they see is a facade of the lack of reality that you're spending your money. And they're thinking you're receiving, not knowing your money is coming from working other places. That helps the church be able to do the ministry because God allowed it to be done that way. And God said, if you set up the ministry that way, he'll rebuke the devourer and he'll destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine pass or fruit before the time in the field. He'll make sure you have that the devourer won't take what should have been stored up in a time of need. In other words, God is allowing you to know there are devourers that will take. And to prevent the devourers from taking, you have to follow the principle of God, the organizational structure of God. I have a wealth of knowledge of Christian finance. Churches operate almost like any other household when it comes to the finance with debt, the responsibility. They have water bill, they have electric, they have oil or gas. They have a telephone bill. They have a an alarm bill now. Many didn't, but they have to now. They break in churches like anything else. They have a cleaning expense. 
The church isn't going to clean itself. They have repair bill. There's much repair that needs to be done. They have paid staff. People can't afford to be there if they have to be someplace else to make money to take care of their personal finance. And much church that does extremely well have paid staff. And I know that from experience because they can be there. You can't call in and take off of your job all the time. You'll lose your job and you'll be no good to the church or your own household. And God would not want you losing your job because you can't be at a place because they don't have the resources to pay. And then some people criticize those that get paid. But paid staff churches function better than churches that don't have paid staff. And it's not because of, it's not the amount they're paying, it's because they can be there. They don't have to worry about trying to call in and take off to be and do a service at a church. They're there to do the service. And many people don't appreciate that unless they've been at a church that has that stand. And those who've never been at a church that has that stand don't understand. They have no understanding. When you're getting calls on your job about church business that you cannot take because then you're dishonoring God by taking calls on your job that you're supposed to be paid to do that job you're hired for. They didn't hire you to do church job. They hired you to do the job you were hired for. So then you have to coordinate between your schedule to try to get back with the church to do whatever is needed. It's like you have two jobs, but you're only getting paid from one. And we don't appreciate those people like we should. We take them for granted. But if they go someplace else and get paid, you're the first one to keep up foolishness. When they were there and you didn't respect them, you didn't honor them, and you didn't appreciate them. But somebody else will respect them, honor them, and appreciate them. Because you didn't honor, respect, and appreciate the Lord for allowing the person to even be there to volunteer. See, those are the problems that we have here. And very large churches have higher bills, higher responsibility. They're open more during the week. They have more people coming during the week. They have more responsibility, more ministry responsibility, which requires them to have more ministers available. And don't let somebody pass away. They have to be there for the service. And if they're working, they may not be able to take off that day. And you'll be complaining because you didn't have a choir. You didn't have a musician. You don't have ushers. You don't have repays. Those things are not free and they require labor and dedication. But you don't appreciate it unless it happens to you and you need those resources. We don't look outside of self and be considerate of others. See, I've been in the church a long time. So I understand to always think about others and including things that could happen. If you have a long 
large congregation and you're sending out flowers, you can have a monthly bill more than your mortgage. You cannot determine who gets ill and who passes away or who gets a wedding or who has a baby or staff for birthdays or anything you want to give out of generosity to show your appreciation. For some reason, people think the money just comes out of the sky. And you understand you have to pay your bills. The next time you go in a church and look around, they have bills to pay too. Nothing is free. And everybody functioning have to live often working and receiving an income. They have responsibility as everybody else. And yet they have to come when funds are limited. I ministered for over 20 something years, never taking a dime. and the audacity of some of the things that are going on. Complaining. When people have to work to pay their responsibility. But you'll call my job, put my job on jeopardy, but you won't pay. I'm okay as long as I'm there for every service. but you won't pay. I'm okay as long as I go to every hospital visitation, but you won't pay no gas, no parking fee. I'm okay as long as I do everything that's for you, but there's no payment. But let me go someplace else and they appreciate the cost and labor and they pay, then there's a big problem. And some of you will put people's jobs in jeopardy. You'll call them all day long over church stuff, know they're working, and they cannot be on their phone. And you won't take that into consideration. You won't wait to after hours. Leave a message on their answer machine and get with them on the weekend or playing in a van. Sometimes we can be so inconsiderate with what we expect of people that you forget they have responsibilities just like you. And then we'll see a salary and get jealous. And you'll want to do it and never took interest in doing it before. But think you're going to get the salary. And then get the position and won't even be honorable to it. Dedicated to it. You see, these are the problems that many leadership have to go through in the body of Christ. And we don't always discuss it because we have to deal with it internally. And these companies, they want their money just like any other organization want their money. You can't call the electric bill and say, I, I, I pray. No, they're going to ask you to bring a check and pay your bill. You can't do it for your own home. What makes you think you're going to do it for a church? God didn't tell you to make bills you don't pay, whether it be the body of Christ or whether it be your personal bill. If you have bills, work to pay your bills. Take care of the financial responsibilities that you have made a commitment to be obligated to. That's the Christian thing to do. And that's why some companies are afraid to hire Christians. 
Because some Christians will function worse than some heathens in honoring the time, the supply, and the honesty of work hours. We shouldn't, but we do that sometimes. We'll take the copier machine and use their paper, their ink, for personal things. We'll use the phone to take and do personal calls. We'll leave early, get in late. Not all, but some makes it bad for others. And then we always want to try to get something. But has never given anything, did anything, don't even understand the structure and the requirement of what is required. To know what you're even coming into. And some won't even be trained properly. Don't even have a clue of what's required. You can get a phone call at 11 o'clock at night, an emergency phone call. They need you at the hospital. They need you to pray for them. Anything can come up. Sometimes you get 15, 20 calls a day, depending on how big the church is and what's going on on that day. Sometimes you're needed at four or five places and you can't be four or five places together. And heaven forbid, if you plan any type of family, personal activity. But sometimes people don't see the big picture. They don't understand. And then they don't want you to take a vacation. If you plan a vacation, migrations, and don't go on vacation. Your phone will ring worse than when you were not on vacation. We have to look at staff and appreciate staff. Appreciate those who labor before you. We need time to prepare our messages. We have to have time to hear from God. And we have personal responsibilities as well. And God did not give people family to neglect family responsibility. He knew you had family responsibilities when he called you. So he expects you to be able to take care of your family responsibilities and your calling responsibilities. You can't be every place all of the time. You're only one person. And some people don't appreciate that, don't understand. They will use you up, pay you nothing, and then not appreciate one thing you've done. And bad mouthy. After you've done all that you've done, it still wasn't enough. That's why when you minister, you minister unto God. And you let God handle it. Because some people are just takers. They'll come and sit in a church and won't put a dime in. They won't give nothing to the Lord. But they'll take everything they can. And then the minute something going on, they want to receive. They want to have their services at your church. They want you to come and pray. They want you to visit. 
Give communion if they can't make it. And no one's complaining. This is the reality of what you don't see. The labor that goes on. 24-7. You just see minor moments. You don't see all the 24-7. And I don't know which one is worse. When you work at the church and be paid. Or if you work somebody else and be paid and you go to the church to labor there, but you're not a paid staff. It's almost depending on the size of the church that determines how much you can handle it and not neglect your responsibilities. And God never wants you neglecting your responsibility. You can have some pastors that get so busy, they neglect their spouse and their kids. Miss so many personal activities. Miss their kids growing up. Because they can't properly coordinate all the responsibilities that just comes before them. Have a great, great heart, very, very kind and compassionate. But they don't know how to say no. They don't know how to delegate and let other ministers get involved. But then there's some churches they don't want nobody but the pastor. If he or she can't come, we don't want nobody else. And, it, and then if they don't come, they get an attitude. And if you do for one family and don't do for the other family, there's a big disagreement. And so you have to appreciate those that labor before you. Show them your appreciation. Tell them your appreciation. Pray for them. Honor God for them. If you honor God, you'll honor what God has sent to you to labor before you in the spirit of Christ. And he will allow that blessing to always be before you. If not, he'll take it away. You have to appreciate it. He'll take it away if you don't. And place it where it's appreciated. And others will appreciate it greatly. Don't ever think somebody won't. Despair, you can find many passages that convey the ideal of feeling abandoned or overwhelmed or in the face of adversity or difficult circumstances. And sometimes leaders get exhausted. They get exhausted and they need to be encouraged. Some can learn how to encourage themselves. I'm one that can just learn how to encourage myself. I've never felt to the point that I felt that I couldn't encourage myself. I've never felt to the point where I felt I couldn't go to the Lord and go through whatever I'm going through. When I was being called 24-7, working all these long hours, sometimes working at another place, no, but one salary. I've never worked two, two salaries in my life. Never got paid under the table. Don't know anything about that. But you feel like 
You don't have moments that you need with the Lord. And so you have to sneak it in. If it's at one or two o'clock in the morning, you have to get up at one or two o'clock and sneak in that time with the Lord. You can't get too busy. You forgot God. Because without him, you will not be able to make it through this situation. There were times God would put me on a fast. And I would say, oh, my gracious, I'm on a fast. And he would keep me on that fast. So when things would come for somehow or another, he would be able to orchestrate everything for me. And it would just flow. I would have the energy, unbelievable. Not taking no vitamins or nothing. Just energy to be able to do what he knew I needed to do. But as you get older, you sometimes it catches up with you. There could be times I could go like that for three weeks. Now, maybe three days, I may feel like I need to get away. Sometimes it changes depending on how God works in your life. But you have to know how to spend all that time you can in the morning and at night before God. If not, you'll be operating in the flesh and not the spirit. And you can't always expect people to appreciate your labor before God. You have to know that all that you're doing, you're doing to the glory of God. So you have to remind yourself, Lord, I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this for you. And if they appreciate it, that's great. That's an added blessing. That's an added appreciation and thankfulness to God. Thank you, God, that you placed me at a place that I can labor and people appreciate my labor. Thank you, God, that you have had people that understand and have a heart like you. Not everybody has that. So don't ever take that for granted. When people love and have a heart like that, everybody does not have that. Some only get that when they lose what they have. Lamentation is the book in the Old Testament that talks about a lot of despair. It is attributed to the prophet Jeremiah, where Jeremiah expresses deep sorrow and lamentation over the destruction of Jerusalem and the suffering of the Jewish people. The writing is filled with verses that conveys a sense of hopelessness and anguish. We can find hopelessness and anguish and despair all throughout the scripture. See, that's not unusual for people in the faith or not in the faith to experience that. Many people in the faith experience anguish, despair, frustration, irritation, and hopelessness. But it's how we deal with it when we feel that way. I'm just one that never really gets to that point, but I've been around people that do get to that point, so I understand. Everybody's different. The Psalms of Lament. In the writing of Psalms, they are called Psalms of Lament. But the psalmist pours out their distress and sorrow to God. Sometimes you feel sorrow and heavy burden over things that other people are going to. If you've ever been one that counsels a lot, you really have to be careful. You have to make sure you stay prayed up. Make sure you have quiet times to think of things that are good and pure and true and honest and of a good report. Because if you don't, the things that you counsel will begin to be a burden over you. And they can make you feel so in despair and frustrated. Because you're beginning to have compassion for things other people are going through. And it's things that you can't do for them that you want to do for them. It could be a death 
and someone's grieving and you want to you want to be there to comfort them but you can't be there all the time so you try to be with them and their family for as long as you can it could be a sick child in the hospital you want to be there so you go to the hospital you spend all the time with the family and you really want to be there to comfort them but you can't be there all the time it could be financial problems. You want to help and assist. And you try to do whatever little you can, but you don't have the resources to do it as long as you want to. It could be anything that could be so compelling to your heart when you care for these people and you begin to feel what they're going through. That's sympathy. That's compassion. That's empathy. Because you're human and God has compassion. He's a compassionate God. He understands what you're going through. And sometimes people just need a hug. They need a word of encouragement. They need to know you care. They need to know that you will listen to them. They don't always need a response. Sometimes they just want to speak through it and try to process what they're going through. And sometimes they just need to know. You understand. It's normal. You're human. And sometimes things happen beyond our control. A lot learned that during the pandemic. They couldn't control loved ones leaving. They couldn't control jobs shutting down. They couldn't control. They couldn't take the shots. They couldn't control companies closing their doors. They couldn't control the economic going up higher than their salary. They couldn't control churches were no longer available to go freely. And they couldn't sit and hug and be around people. It's just a natural process of life. But God provides help and deliverance. And Psalms 42 is a good example of such a lament. Job's suffering also gives us immense suffering and loss. Job, Job experiences are often associated with despair. He questioned God's justice and struggles to find meaning in his suffering. Sometimes even pastors, sometimes even believers will question God. God, I've served for you. Why is this happening? Sometimes things happen. And we can question God. It's okay to have a dialogue with God. It's okay to ask God for help. It's okay to ask God why. It's okay to wait to hear a response. Ultimately, the importance of Job was to show trust and faith in a God, even in the midst of despair. See, these writings in the Bible tells us how others dealt with despair, how others dealt with loss, how others dealt with hurt, how others dealt with distress, how others dealt with frustration and irritation and exhaustion. It's a part of life we're human. I mean, my Lord, Jesus the Godhead created the earth, and on the seventh day, he rested. We all need rest to be restored, rejuvenated, to be able to continue this course and path of life. And no matter what we go through, we must hold on to the importance of trust and faith. Trust and faith. Even in the midst of despair, because some people are just wicked. And you can never let wicked and unrighteousness prevail. Some people are just wicked. And if you stay around wicked spirits and evil spirits, you'll pick up their spirits. You'll become divine. You'll become conformed. There are familiar spirits that God warns about. 
that many in biblical time had experienced. The soothsaying, the witchcraft, but they should have no impact over the believer's life. Because we are covered by the blood. We have more power than the witchcraft, the soothsayer, and evil spirits. That's why you should never allow them to take your mind. Never allow them to snatch your joy. Never allow them to make you labor when you're so tired. You don't have time for God. Keep him first in all you do. And he'll give you what you need to do his will. Ecclesiastic, King Solomon, he reflects on the futility and meaningless of life. While it does not use the term despair, he explores existential questions and disillusionment can, that can lead to feelings of despair. Never think that you're the only one that has to do something. Never think that. Ask God first. And never be afraid to say, I can't. Not at this moment. God will never give you more than you can make. And sometimes leaders, ministers, clergy, we become so consumed with our congregation that we forget we can't do it all. It's okay. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. He didn't say he wants you to do all things. You can do all things that he wants you to do. Not what people want you to do. See, they take that scripture and they read it the wrong way. It's whatever God wants you to do, you can do all things. Not what people want. I remember being an interim pastor. I started in the ministry at a very young age. And I was always around very mature, seasoned pastors who had been pastoring 30 and 40 years. So they had experience. And being young, I was able to tap into their resources. I watch how the mature ones, how the experienced and seasoned one always made sure they handled family responsibilities in addition to doing the work of the ministry. They never got too large when they thought they would delegate their family responsibility to others. They knew God gave them a family and they were thankful to God for their family. So they took care of their family responsibility in addition to doing the work of the ministry. That makes a difference. That always makes a difference in me. And I was able to be around pastors that I wouldn't even a member of the church with these pastors, but I would be around some of them. And I was always thankful to God that God put them in my life. They were just down to earth. They never let their position go to their head. They never got too large that they lost the heart and compassion for God and the people they came into contact with. They were just, it was just something about them. I never told them. I always prayed.
for them, but they were always like my pastor, but I never told them. Never joined their church, but they were always like my pastor. It was a connection in the spirit with the heart. It was just a connection. I can't explain it. I couldn't even tell them why I was not able to join their church because God had me other places. And there was nothing wrong with their church. But he didn't want me there then. He had me laboring other places and I had to remain where I was at laboring. But they were always in my heart. And for some reason, they were always able to hear from God on certain circumstances that I might have been going through. Every pastor need a pastor in the flesh that operates in the spirit, the, the human side at times, because we're human. And we interact with people. And every pastor needs a pastor sometimes just to know that God is working through them and confirming what they're telling you. That's just how God is created. See, sometimes we think pastors only whose name is on the road. But it's deeper than that. It's who's in your heart. Because everybody's name on the road is not in your heart. Just like everybody's name on the road is not making it into the book of the land of life. It's deeper than that. And so God just had established that. And I can't explain. It, it was just something God had done. And I, I was real young when I met these people. And I watched them over the years. See, character doesn't change. It builds. It personifies consistency godly character it doesn't change and I watched the godly character that never changed whether they got really long it never changed less people they never changed And so sometimes we don't understand how many people will have you in their heart, but you don't always see it. You don't always fellowship with them, but they are forever in your heart and on your mind through your prayer and remembrance of things that were very important that God imparted through using them. Don't ever think you can only minister to those who have their name on your rope. I learned that real young when I ministered to a multitude that was never members of my church. That they were very connected to me. And then I could go many places and I would be entreated by many people. Don't ever let the enemy come in and stop that and make it about personal agendas. That's not how God operates. New Testament hope. There's a strong emphasis on hope, redemption, and comforting presence of God through faith in Jesus Christ. While despair and suffering 
acknowledge there is also a message of hope and salvation through Christ's sacrifice and resurrection. The Bible does not use the word despair directly, but it contains many passages and stories that addresses themes of suffering, lamentation, and the human experience of facing overwhelming challenges. These passages in the New Testament are often there to serve you, to encourage in your faith, trust, and hope in God's providence and redemption, even in the midst of despairing circumstance. You never know what people go through. You never know. There was one pastor that I met at a very young age. And he had a heart attack. And the doctors had told him that he probably would never, ever preach again. It always puzzled me. And I shared something to him. And then I told him, you know, I don't believe God would have called you, given you this church. You labor diligently, loving your congregation, the believers, and loving God, that he would allow you never to preach again. Never to pastor again. Th that doesn't sound like God. That sounds like the devil's being made. Because you're touching too many lives. You're touching those that others would never be touched by. You're ministering to those that others would not even look twice at. And you're humble in the way that you're ministering to these people. And so one day we were walking as he was recuperating and we were just talking about the goodness of the Lord. We just took a brief walk, not, not long, just a little around the circle of the church or something like a little brief walk. And we were just talking about how good God is. Very humble person. Very humble. I met some, some, some really people that stays in my heart. See, I don't have to be with you to pray for you and appreciate God for you for the ministry that you do. And so the first day he was going to return back to the pulpit, I left my home church because I'm, I'm normally with these people, but I don't join them. I don't know why. I guess God just, you know, had me at other places. And it, it was well. And I promised that I would come when he got back in the pulpit. So I went and I sat in the congregation and I watched him preach. And I was there praying on his behalf at the seat. And he stood up to preach. Now, granted, the doctor told him that if he got too excited, he might have another heart attack and not make it. And he's a preacher that gets excited sometimes, like me. Sometimes the spirit just hits you and you just get excited. And it just comes forward. And so he was trying to be very reserved, talking about the goodness of God, and he was presenting his message. And I'm sitting there praying, looking at him so proud that he's back in that pulpit. Don't let the devil try to take you off the track. God didn't call you, bring you this far just to leave you. Yeah, yeah. That was an old song my grandmother used to sing. I don't feel no waste time. I come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me that the road would be. <laughs> I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. 
And I started humbling that song as he was preaching. I don't feel no way tired. And the spirit just started moving all over that place. And the spirit let loose in him. And he began to preach like he's never preached before. And he never had no problem that day. Never. Sometimes we can hear from other people that will make us paralyzed and fearful to do the will of God if we're not careful. We have to believe the report of God above all others. It wasn't that the doctors had wrong intentions. He was telling him what he thought to be true from a medical practice. But God had other plans. What am I saying? You must believe the report of the Lord over all others. You must believe the report of the Lord over all others. I'll never forget that. And sometimes those things happen. Now, there are many pastors and people that I don't be around that, I, that, that are in my heart. And I pray for them because I understand the labor that they do, the, 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 the works that they do, that they do. And, and, and sometimes you don't always feel appreciated. And sometimes we, we need that prayer and we can feel it. And we know how to pray for ourselves too. But it happens. And so... That that Sunday was a, 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 a testimony of what God could do. The Holy Spirit took off through him. And he forgot at that moment that he had heart surgery. He forgot everything the doctors had told him. And the congregation forgot he had heart surgery. You didn't see a pastor preaching with heart surgery. You saw a pastor preaching through the Holy Spirit. And it was a testimony of what God can do. But we can't allow ourselves to become fearful. Because if God wants you to do something, he's going to have you to do it. You're not going nowhere until you finish the purpose of your creation. There's one pastor that said she had a problem with her eye. Lost eyesight in her eye. That hasn't stopped her from proclaiming that gospel. She can bring that word anytime, any place, and anywhere. And sometimes I don't even think she's even worried about that eye because it's not stopping her from doing nothing. She knows she's getting old, but it never stopped her from doing what God called her to do. What am I saying? Sometimes we have problems in these earthly bodies like Paul had some problems. But when you remain committed to God, somehow, some way, he's going to make a way for you to continue to do what thus says the Lord. That's who he is, a God that can do exceedingly, abundantly, of, of all that we could ever ask or think of according to the power 
that work it within us. Sometimes the road won't be easy. But he didn't bring you this far to leave. For anybody that might be going through anything, pastor, no pastor. We all go through problems in life. Don't ever think that God has left you. I know sometimes we feel forsaken. I know sometimes we feel unappreciative. I know sometimes we feel the responsibility that sometimes are overwhelming with no moments to sell. But there's a God that can restore you reward you with his comforting spirit, his mercy and love and grace that will give you the ability to continue to move forward. Some of you are sick and you're dealing with some complications. Don't let that stop you from doing the work of the Lord. Don't, don't let that stop you from doing the work of the Lord. I have an uncle that I love dearly. He's, he's been in the ministry for a while. And when he went in the ministry, I wasn't around him. So I never really heard him preach or pastor or teach. I wasn't around him when he, when he became a pastor. And so God took me to him. And I spent some time with him. Because I just wasn't around him. And God just took me around him. And I learned some of his ways. I, I, I learned. He's very compassionate. Uh, he, he, he's very, very, very uh, self-controlled. And I'm not just saying this because he's my uncle. I'm saying it because I'm speaking from the spirit. He has a very unique spirit able to, to, to just let some things just go, but yet very uh, um, um, understanding of the things of God. And when I spent time around him, as he was preaching and teaching the word of God, and he has a musical ability too. God has gifted him with many abilities. And he was, you know, raised in the church. So he'd been there for a long time. And, and, and when he accepted his call, I, I saw how he was flourishing. How God was moving upon his life. But what you learn is that when you have God moving upon your life and, and, and you, you, you're progressing in ways that you can't even imagine as God is navigating you through trials and tribulation, they come against you. Things come against you. Because the adversary don't want those who are laboring for God to be in the liberty, the freedom, the joy, the love, the comfort, and the assurance to do the will of God. You know, the adversary is not happy. Too many people are viewing God as being God. Too many people want their life in Christ. Too many people are praying. Too many people are sincere about the things of God. Too many people want to know the love of God. Too many people are calling on the name of God. And when all these people are laboring for God and unification about the things of God, the adversary is angry because remember, he got kicked. 
out of the abide with God and he'll never be restored and reconciled. And so you learn that as you're doing the will of God, sometimes things happen, but you can't get in despair. The minute you resolve one problem, another problem comes. The minute you get over that problem, another problem comes. And every time you turn around, it's coming in all directions. And you got to listen to God. And so as you have, even when you have family members that are preachers, they all got to listen to God. Your ministry may not be their ministry. But you're not against them. You just got different ministries. And there are times you will be and times you won't. Because the work of the ministry goes on. That's just how God is. Paul went one way. Peter went another way. But they loved each other. But they weren't always together. But they prayed for each other. But they weren't always together. But they were on each other's mind. But they weren't always together. And those are the things you go through. No one can tell you how to handle any difficulties or medical things you go through in life. Only God. The doctor told that person who had a heart attack, he could never preach again properly. If he got upset, he might have another heart attack. He's still living, as far as I know today. The other person had power with their eyes. They're still able to preach and, and, and do what thus says the Lord. Sometimes we experience things like Paul. Why did he have a thorn in his flesh? Paul can heal everybody else, but he couldn't heal his own thorn in the flesh. We don't always know, but it doesn't hinder the progress that God has put in your life. Paul's anointing was unheard of. The things that he could do. The things he could do. It was unheard of. It was a great anointing. And so what God lets us know is don't ever be disencouraged for whatever you're going through. God is able. Whatever comes your way, God is able. Trust God beyond human understanding. God did not bring you this far to leave you. Whether you are in prosperity or lack, God is able. Just know, God did not bring you this far to leave you. I'm amazed at how God has me doing the ministry this way. I would have never thought it. I would have never planned it. But God knew. And he guided me through that way. And I obeyed him. And God rewards his obedience. Not people obedience, his obedience. Never let people tell you what God has never told you.
Never let people guide you where God is never guiding you. Because your blessing, your reward comes from honoring the God that you say you serve and love. That's the commitment, the allegiance that you have. I have a brother in the ministry. His ministry is different. And you learn from people that you're close to and not that their ministries are different. It doesn't negate which one is important and which one is not. They're different. All the disciples' ministry was not the same. Remember, Jesus took John, James, and Peter. He took them to the transfiguration. He took them to do much healing. But he didn't take the rest of them. The ministry that he was having to be birthed from them for that moment was different. He normally did much with them, but not with the other. It wasn't that he didn't love them all. It was their faith was a little different. And so he was working with them a little different. It's not that I don't love everybody. Sometimes you have a closer connection in the spirit because of the similarity that God places in. Jesus loved the other disciples. But he didn't take them everywhere. Jesus trained all of the disciples but he didn't take them everywhere. And there was a reason for the inner circles that didn't include all of the disciples. He never told us why. But we know he did it. And Jesus doesn't do anything except there's a reason. That's just our body. So you don't worry about who's trying to orchestrate stuff. You let God work it out. Because when you get to a point in life where you have a rooted foundation in the Lord, you know God's going to get what he wants when he wants it anyway. And flesh and blood can't accomplish it. And so you let God to work it out. I remember... working at a company and we were going through some problems at this company right after I bought my house and I didn't know if I was going to have a job or not. And when I was a member of another church when I bought my house and my job was not sure if I could keep my job for whatever reason. I was attending another church at night. And I would go there because a lot of people at my company would be members of this church and every time they had revivals, I would go there to get away and enjoy myself in the Lord. See, when I enjoy myself, I'm usually around things of God. And I was there at night, and I usually go there for the preaching and teaching. 
as well as the music, because a lot of times we have guest preachers that will come and they, you know, do their revival. People that are not in this area. And I was there one night and I was heavy. And I, I must admit, I was worrying. I know how this man feels. He was about to get evicted. I wasn't about to get evicted, but I mean, if I didn't keep my job, I would have been evicted. I had just bought the house. Hadn't even been in the house a month and was told I may not even have a, a job. Now, I'm making good money. And you know, when you lose one job, sometimes you don't get the same amount. You have to go down. So they said, we can move you to another position, but we're going to have to lower your salary after so many months. And you know, when you buy a house, you don't want your salary lowered because that puts you in greater financial responsibility. And so I went to the revival. It just so happened the day that I got the news that this was going to happen. I went on, I went to revive. Somebody had told me, you know, we got to revive. And I always go to their church. So I said, okay, I'll be there. So I, Went home, changed my clothes, and went to the revival. And I'm sitting there talking to God, thanking God for all that he has done. He, he bought the house. He put me in a job that could afford the house. And everything's going well, but I'm just getting a notice that we may have to eliminate this job. And I asked them, why didn't you tell me that before I went to sell? So I called my settlement attorney, uh, the, the paper, and I said, can I get rid of the house? They say, I'm sorry, it's yours. You got to keep it. You can sell it, but it's yours. So I'm sitting at the church talking to the Lord saying, Lord, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I wasn't afraid. I was confused. And as I was sitting there and the choir was singing and the, past, the guest pastor came on and started preaching. I'll never forget who he is. And he walked over to where I was sitting. And I didn't know him. He didn't know me. And he said something very provoke, pro, pro, profound to me. He said, you're going through something now. And you're questioning God why. Now, he don't know me. I don't know him. I'm praying. And he had to have heard it from God. We don't know each other. And he said, but when God worked this out, you're going to know that God did. And nobody else. It's going to work out. Because God wouldn't have done what he did and not follow through on it. I went home that night after the sermon. And I laid in the bed. And I began to talk to God. And I asked God, was that from you? And if so, how did he know? And I went to sleep, woke up the next day, went to work. Went to look on the board for where they have promotions at when you want to have in-house promotions. And I saw a job. I applied for it. Went back to the revival the other two day, nights because it was for three nights. Got a call from the supervisor personnel. And I was transferred to another department. Kept my salary. And by the time that my salary could have been reduced, I got promoted. You tell me God is not good. It takes being around those who love the Lord like you to encourage one another, to fellowship one another whether you're going through something or not. And we don't understand what the reason the body of Christ is for. 
We think it's just for entertaining sometimes, but it's not. It's so that we can come together and encourage one another in life circumstances and partake of the fellowship of the ministry through music and the impartation of his word. You never know, no matter where you at, what somebody's going through. And sometimes just being among the saints, there's a difference about the saints. Don't get me wrong. There should be a difference. Being among the saints, sometimes it makes all the difference in the world. God will speak through them. He'll speak to you alone. He'll confirm it among them. And your mind will stay on the things of Christ. And you won't get in despair. You won't get discouraged. You won't feel hopeless. You won't be fearful. You'll know that you got a God that's able. That's why the Bible says the testimony of the saints overcome. Don't ever forget what God has done for you. Don't ever forget what God has done for you. And don't let people speak into your life that God never spoke. God worked it out. Kept me there for many years. Lacking nothing. And I kept getting promoted. Every time I turned around, kept getting promoted. Sometimes two and three raises in a year. Never missing a day from church. Always being faithful to the Lord, giving, serving. And God was constantly giving back. What am I saying? When your heart is true before God, God will always come through somehow, some way. You just can't give up on God. If the church but now help this young man. If he would have just held on and not attempted to do what he was doing, God would have came through for him some way, somehow, someplace else. He could have used an unsaved person to get to him and assist. God can use anybody he won. God can use anybody and bring righteous mammon to you if you just hold on. And sometimes we get so impatient And we depend upon thinking God can only come one way when God can come any way he wants. Don't let people speak to you what God is never speaking to you about. Because the adversary will use people that don't know and don't understand to speak to you the things they have no knowledge of. Keep the testimony of what you know God has done for you and hold on to it. See, I knew God did that for me. So I could hold on to that testimony no matter what I went through. No one could tell me. You didn't do it. God did. You didn't give it. God did. You didn't supply it. God did. 
You didn't even know what I was going through. God did. You weren't there. God was. And how can you tell me now when you don't even know? Everybody deals with situations differently. And God knows that. That's why you have to seek God and how to deal with your situation. See, sometimes people feel like it's all over. No, it's not all over. As long as you have breath, there's hope. As long as you have breath, there's hope. And we're living in a world, you better know. Don't let anybody define you by where you're at. Don't let anybody define you by people. Don't let anybody tell you what God has never told you or shown you. Hold on because God can speak directly to you and it can be confirmed by others. It has when you are in the right connection with others that fast and pray and are hearing from God. I know it to be true. Everybody is not in personal agenda. There are some that can get to that throne. Ha, la, 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 la. Don't ever give up on God. You never know what people go through. You can't look at somebody. That's why God says he's a spirit. And don't get upset when people speak foolishness to you. Because they don't know. Just tell them. That's not what God is telling me. I'm holding on to the promises of God. Excuse me. But don't. Tell me what God has not told me. Sometimes you have to do like Jesus. Rebuke Peter. Get thee behind me, Satan. I'm doing my father's will. Don't ever think Satan won't try to stop you. Don't ever think Satan won't try to disencourage you. Don't ever think Satan won't put false thoughts in your mind through others. That's why God encourages the fellowship of the saints. That's why it's necessary. But we don't see the necessity of it. Because you're there for God. And if you're there for God, you're going to receive God. You're going to hear from God. You're going to have the movement of God upon your life. And you're going to have the validation from God. Don't think God can't work through vessels. I know it to be true. There are some I know. God speaks to them like he speaks to me. We can be on one accord and nobody told us. We just know there's a connection. And we don't have to see each other. Because there's a connection in the spirit. That's why it's quite often further than sight. When you're dealing in the spiritual realm, the deeper the anointing, the deeper the spiritual realm you enter into. That's why everybody couldn't go with Jesus. 
He had 12. All 12 couldn't go. Only three. Let us get ready to close. We never know what people go through in the body of Christ. And we can never get so self-absorbed that we forget the heart of God. And the adversary will let things happen in your life. When you are being effective in many lives and he doesn't want that to go for he will bring havoc to try to stop you hinder you paralyze you take you off course and disencourage you don't ever doubt god keep your trust and faith in the lord don't let despair overrule you don't let despair overrule you. Don't let despair overrule you. See, we can always talk about the prosperity and the good time. And that's fine. I don't know lack. I've always had prosperity. But when I experience lack, it didn't put me in despair. I learned how to navigate through it. And it was somewhat enjoyable, I hate to say it. It was because God taught me how to do things I wouldn't have never been doing. And God is very creative. And I was rather impressed with how God was developing and showing me some things that I would not have done in prosperity. See, every situation, God can navigate you through those points in life. And not everybody is, can do it because it depends on your faith in God. That's why Paul said, I've learned whatever condition I'm in to be content. See, this is not about flowers. Don't let people speak into your mind that lack the godliness and understanding from God. Because there's a time when God tells you, rebuke it, that your life is too important for foolishness. And sometimes people get to the point in life and they're around foolishness and you have to get away. Because if you don't, you'll pick up a spirit of despair. You'll pick up a spirit of distress. You'll pick up a spirit of depression. And it will zap your life. We have to know how to rebuke it, how to go through it with God, and how to speak to it. And let them know what your Father in heaven says, who has all authority. All authority. The reason I came out with that article, because some people think when they see what we have accomplished as pastors and ministers, that we received it from the church. They don't know the labors that we've done outside of the church, that when we come and go into some places, we've already had everything we had. For some reason, they think we got it from the church or we got it from going to church. 
You know, they have a false perception. Come to God, you get this. Come to God, you get that. You know, we want to market God like we market in stores. And you have some people that do that. But God didn't tell you that. You better know. The truthfulness of who God is. And you better let God give you the fulfillment of his promise of who he is. See, I don't need to be encouraged. I'm not disencouraged over nothing. Huh? Because I have a God that I have a relationship with. And I don't listen to everybody. Huh? Woo. Everybody, I can't partake of. Everybody, can't, I can't be around. Everybody, there's no agreement. Everybody. God just not, not going to let it go. Because God is a justice God. And a justice God is going to get his will. And that's why you have to hold on to God. Is this the fast I've called for you? You better know when God is calling you. You better know. Sometimes you got to turn down that plate. Sometimes you got to walk away from some people. Sometimes you got to stand for God. And it's righteousness and ignore some things. See, people think standing is in a pulpit in a church. No, nah, too many people are in there, put there, but they're not standing for God. They're not standing for his righteousness. They're not standing for his principles. They're not standing for his morals. They're not standing for his values. They're just there. Personal agendas. That's why God said judgment is going to start at the household of faith. Not about a school building. That's not what this is about. It may be for you, but make no mistake. Huh. <laughs> Jesus took three. He didn't take all the 12. Some trust in horses and some trust in chariots. But everybody didn't trust in the Lord. And Jesus know who puts their trust in him and who puts their trust in what others tell them. And God never told them. It was just plain. So you don't get the rewards. Let us bring this to close. Hi. I knew I had a pastor's heart very early in ministry because of the compassion I had for those like me. I could understand what they're going through. And I didn't want to have to go through what I saw many go through. And God showed me how to navigate through that. And so you'll see, I never get involved in that. I let God work it out. But you make 
no mistake, you know where I stand. Because my life is too important with God. He's been too good for me. See, this is not a mother and father journey. This is a me journey. They can't do what God could do. They don't know what God knew. They didn't do what God did. And they didn't give what God gave. Don't ever forget what God does for you. Don't let despair consume you. Don't let despair consume you. See, this is not about music. This is about trusting in God. Trust God for everything in your life. I would tell you half the things that I know, many will be surprised. Everything that goes on is not coming from God. Some of it is self-will overflow. Control. I have on my computer right now roses, not roses, flowers. See, the only one that got this is God. I'm not the lily in the valley. Jesus is the lily in the valley. I'm not down. I'm not out. Either. I'm in Christ Jesus. Because he said, now if you want to make him a liar, that's between you and him. When you labor for God and your motives is for God, you may get a little concerned, but what will keep you through it all is to remember that all you did, you did it unto the Lord. When you understand that all you do, you do unto the Lord, God will reward you. Don't worry about it. God will take care of your daily provisions. I told you before, don't ever associate me with a color. I can't accept that. My God is a spirit and a spirit resides within. I know no one by the color. I know no one by the flesh because I am commanded to know by the spirit. If you want to be blessed by God, you better honor God's ways. See, I didn't get this far. But not honoring God's ways. I didn't get this flaw, but not putting my faith and trust in God. I didn't get this far, but not being able to hear from God. I didn't get this far, but not standing up against some things that God said no. If you want to get something, you better get the Lord. High and lift it up. Because 
God is about to do something. And it's not for those who have not put their full trust in God. These are some critical times coming up. Critical times. You got too many people taking their lives. You got too many companies going through budget cuts. You have too much carjack, too many teenagers being killed. Too many people killing family members and others. There's a spirit permeating. You're back with the mask. You better see the times. And you better know the times. Because it's not the mask keeping you safe. It's the Lord. See, the mask is not stopping me from going to church. That's not what it is. God is telling me not to go. So I'm obeying God. I'm not afraid. Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of the death, I will feel no evil. That's not keeping me away. That's not bothering me at all. I don't know why God told me not to, but I'm going to obey him. Because obedience has always led me to his reward. Even when he led me, when it was nothing there, after I got there, he put it there. And so I follow God's leading. And personally, this was all a piece of cake. And I have to be honest about it. Irritated, but a piece of cake. Irritated, very irritated. Because some things you don't expect from some people. But then you learn because God told you and warned you. It shall come to pass. And then you see the wisdom of God's word edify in our lives as we use it as a reflection of his standards and marvels. Something that changes not. Let me uh, close out with this. I was reading another article and it talked about a judge. And this particular judge had overwritten a drag show to be held at a Texas university. It was at the federal courts level. And the LGBTQ group claimed that because this judge was a Christian, he was not fair He could not be fair and impartial. Everybody say thank you, Lord, for Christian judges. Now you see, they won't accept our Christianity, but they want us to accept their waywardness. And the Bible talks about this. And Christians, y'all better be careful. You will accept their ways, but they will not accept your ways. And now they're telling a judge he cannot be fair and impartial because he's a Christian. No, he's showing who his allegiance is to, God. He understands that he can either be accepted by humanity and be damned unto damnation, or he can be accepted by Christ Jesus and make it into heaven.
That's what they mean when they say character. Character should never change based on the job you hold. And some jobs God is not going to put you in if you can't keep his character. This judge could keep his character. That's why he became a judge. He didn't bend and change his character. He kept, at least they knew he was a Christian. At least they knew he was a Christian. They knew he was a Christian because they knew what he stood for. They, the, the problem was that the drag show wanted to expose minors to sexually explicit conduct. And the judge said no. But they had a problem with him because he's a Christian. They said a judge cannot be fair and impartial because he's a Christian. They admitted he's a Christian. We need more judges that are Christians. We mean no, we need more people and positions that are Christians that are not afraid to uphold the character and principle of God, no matter what job they're in. Persecuted because he's a Christian. Blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. He just got blessed for upholding the character of God. Not upholding an office. Not upholding an institution. Upholding the character of God. Higher than an office and an institution. Don't let yourself be bought by the devil to misrepresent God's moral stand. Every job you can't take. If it's going to change who you are in Christ. And we don't think about that. We don't think about that. Every money is not godly money. Every conduct is not godly conduct. And we can't honor everything. And the minute one steps up, he stood up and said no. And they called him a Christian. At least they know what Christians are. They just confirm they know what a Christian is. So they do know there's a difference between a Christian. <laughs> Won't God reveal? Yes, he will. Fast and let God fight your battle. I was so proud and said, if we would have had more that are not afraid to honor God, no matter where they're at, some of you better start honoring God everywhere you at. Because if you don't, you're going to see what is happening behind the scenes for a long time. That many of you know it was coming to pass. Let us go to prayer. Father God, in the precious name of Jesus, we thank you, O oh Heavenly Father, because you are placing those to be able to stand up for your righteousness despite of the job. They're not going to dishonor you or deny you. 
for the mammon of this world. They're going to trust you that if you put them in those positions, you can keep them there as they honor you. And they're going to speak truth in love. So they will know you are high and lifted up. And we thank you, Father. Move upon everyone that desires to have your character unwavering and implemented in every area that they're at, that we may walk uprightly before you, that we will pray for one another, love one another, and treat one another, and brotherly compassion and understanding that you have given us the authority and admonition to do so. Keep us strong in you, Lord, that we uphold all things by the power of your word. As we are live in this world, but not of the world. No matter where we're at. That is never wavering who you are and what you stand for. Let us not be afraid of losing anything for you. Because we can never lose anything for you. You'll return it back sevenfold. And we thank you, God, because of who you are. You are a just God. You are a fair God. You are a righteous God. You are impartial. But you said wisdom comes from above. First is pure. Easily to be entreated. Without hypocrisy. And impartiality. That's what Christians are. We're not accepting the ways of this world. We can't. We belong to you. And you didn't put us in this world too. You drew them out. To teach them the ways of you. You took them in the promised land. And you promise a greater promise. And so, Father, we thank you. That you even have a judge that's not afraid. To uphold your character. You're putting people in high places that are not afraid to uphold your character. They're not bought by this world. They are owned by you. And they're not going to accept everything. And you'll fight their battle. And you'll provide. Because they honored you first. The reverence of God. The reverence of God. The reverence of God. Let us all return back to the reverence of God.
the reverence of God. When we honor you first, and you are whole everything else. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The reverence of God. And everywhere we're at, the reverence of God. And everywhere we're at, the reverence of God. When the laws don't honor you, the reverence of God still honors. When ways don't honor you, the reverence of God still honors. Restore the body of Christ back to the reverence of who you are. Let us not be afraid to remain under your reverence for fear of what's been set in place strategically, but you knew. That's putting hardship on some. Because of the choices that they shouldn't have to make. Let them know there's only one way with you and no other way. And you'll always make a way out of no way. Thank you, God. May we all function in love. Love is true. The spirit of truth that can only come from you. Love is power in a sound mind and not fear. Because we fear you most and reverence you. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. That was so encouraging, God. That was so confirming, God, that you said you were going to work things out and uphold everything by the power, the excellency that you place within these earthly vessels that we can honor you wherever we're at and never be afraid Thank you, God. We understood what the disciples went through. They were afraid when you were crucified and you were buried in the tomb. They knew they would be prosecuted, persecuted. And they would mess with their livelihood, their funds, to be able to live. Retaliation, evil and wickedness and plotting and planning. Because they had a problem with the disciples for over three years as they ministered with Jesus. But you stepped in and worked it out so that they would have power, strength to continue on. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for revealing Revealing you're still in the midst of the situation. You're still in the midst of resolution. You're still working everything out according to your will. You're still placing where you want place. 
those that are going to uphold your character unwaveringly. So when trials and tribulations come, they won't receive the mark. Ha! Because they'll know they are more than a conqueror with you. And you'll never leave them nor forsake them. Oh, how I thank you, God. Thank you for allowing me to use this media platform. This is where you wanted this to come from. <laughs> Your wisdom. Your wisdom. They couldn't stop. The wickedness and unrighteousness couldn't stop it. You navigated through. Ha! Huh? Because you know all things. You took it the way you want it to go. Ha! Huh? Because of what you know, I knew. Hmm. 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 The house couldn't stop it. Ah, la, 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 la. The car couldn't stop it. The job couldn't stop it. The attack on the body couldn't stop it. All unrighteousness couldn't stop it. Ha! And it's still coming. And you're not finished. Because you're about to show your glory in the midst of it. And all will know your will shall be done. You said you would. You said you could. And I thank you, God. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for the vision about your spirit. That changes not. Pray for all God. That you will reveal. Make like minded. So the unity and connection can continue to be birthed forward. That there will be no way. And that your will will be manifested. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Never allow despair to consume. Never allow despair to consume. We all go through some things. And God takes us differently and how we handle something. I, I can't imagine wanting to take my life over anything I've ever purchased or owned. And I'm not criticizing. Because people handle things differently. Some will take their life over a loved one lost. That's just not me. Some will take their life over relationship. That's just not me. Some will take their life over things lost. That's just not me. So you can't criticize those that do that. You just don't understand why. You don't know how much they go through. You don't know what their, where their faith is at, where their trust is at. Whether they're more concerned about what people are going to think or say. And sometimes people are more concerned about what people are going to say, think, or see than what God already knows and is able to work it out. Ha! 
And so when I read articles and see things like that, I have compassion. Because that can happen to anybody. It can happen to anybody. And never think you can be exempt. Because you don't know what can come your way and how many things can come your way if you don't hold on to the faith and trust in Jesus. I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about the Lord. You can find yourself in despair that will consume you. Men in the Bible cried out in despair over seeing what other people is going through. It wasn't always about them. They were concerned about what others are going through. See, when you have a heart for God, you're even concerned about what others are going through. Because you understand that could be you. That could be your loved one. That could be somebody you know. And so you have compassion even when you don't know them. Hoping that God can resolve whatever was going on. Because so much is going on. And some people are wicked. And they do things. And everybody don't know what everybody does. And sometimes people feel like they can't go on because some things are just wicked. But you can never give up on God. Because there's a righteous judgment and he shall come through. That's the hope you can hold on to. How well did Job realize God is good despite of what came up against me? How well did King Solomon understand all of this is futility and meaningless without a life with God? How well did the psalmist lament? Even though I go through some sorrows, God is there to comfort me. If I just hold on and seek. And how well did Jeremiah know? Some things go on in this world that will put you on your knees. Asking God to intervene. It may not be you. It may not impact your family. But it's somebody else's family. Somebody else's loved one. And if you don't have compassion or even thinking about it and praying and ask God to work some things that are going on in this world, if you're not careful, you may wake up one day and be going through what they went through. Don't ever think you exempt from some situations that goes on in this world. There's an overflow that can affect you. You better stay connected to God so that he can comfort you and cover you and keep you doing the overflow. Because if I share some things that went on, you would think it would be impossible but it is. But God is great and able. Be aware of God's ways. It always works. He'll never fail you. He'll never fail you. He'll never fail you. He'll never fail you. There's a wisdom of this word that is folly in the sight of God. There's a spirit of this word that makes people trust in the things of this world over God. And then when those things fail them, when those people fail them, 
they can't go on. Keep your faith and trust in the Lord. He'll have you do things you don't even expect to do. You just do it because he tells you to do it. I don't worry about what I see on my screen. That's folly to me. That shows a lack of understanding. That shows God's wisdom about not putting your faith in trust in some things. That shows human control that really can't control nothing. It's a form of godliness, but a weakness for humanity. If they knew my God, Ask God, and you shall receive. He'll reveal if you wait on him and seek him. See, you don't have to get into everything. Something God don't want you in. And he can keep you out. Even when people think you're in it, he can keep you out of it. I know that to be true. And if you hold on to his promises and obey God for your life, you'll see yourself come out as pure gold. Ha, la, 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 la. Because that's who he is. A purifier, a revealer. Amen, amen, amen. Just trust God. Just trust God. Just trust God. Just trust God. Every time I sit here and do this sermon that God gives me, I leave blessed by him every time. Blessed because I obey him beyond people's understanding. I know how Noah felt when he built that ark and everybody criticized him. Said he was wasting his time. He's crazy. He don't know what he's doing. Because they had never seen the flood. But when the flood came, they were not in the ark. Be careful what you criticize. Because you lack understanding. I know how Job felt when he laid on his back with boils. After he lost his kids and family and everything, and his friends talking to him, you must have did something wrong, Job. And Job began to let that creep in and begin to question God, begin to get a little irritated, you know? People can speak into you and irritate you a little bit, make you doubt God and become a little irritated. But then Job started considering his ways and talking to God, had a dialogue with God, and he saw God knew he could go through it and endure. And the Lord restored abundantly. I didn't understand how Jeremiah felt, seeing the consequences of disobedience. You could see it all over the world. 
and you begin to lament. Lord, how long? When people will allow this to continue. We got kids that just stole a car and crashed it and the car blew up in fire, caught on fire. How long, God? The tragedy. The tragedies that keep coming. Mistakes in hospitals. Tragedies. Everybody want their disease to be more important than anybody else's disease. When God looks and have compassion upon them all. How long, God? God says, if my people who are called by my name, who don't trust in chariots, and don't trust in horses, and don't trust in their money, and don't trust in their wealth, and don't trust in their jobs, and don't trust in everything they think they can put their trust in because that's what society says we are to do. That's what makes us who we are. If they don't trust in those things, they trust in my name and call upon me and seek my face and humble themselves and pray, I'll hear them and I'll heal the lame. How long, God? How long, God? God is good and greatly to be praised. I'm going to close this out. And I don't normally talk about when I fast. But for some reason, God wants me to. God put me on a fast over a month ago. He just called a fast. I don't know why. And he normally does that when something very serious is happening and going to happen as a preparation for what he's doing. He did it at a place one time when we were building something and I was on an extensive fan because of the spiritual warfare we were going through to get something accomplished. And I couldn't really go into detail, but he had it then. He's done it many times before. When I bought my house, he did it then. And moved me to all these jobs that I kept getting promoted consistently. He was doing it then, but now he's doing it. And I really can't tell you why, I don't know. So every time I sit and prepare and do my messages, I'm just doing it because of God's prompting. But he has me on this fast, and I'm not eating meat. I'm not eating meat. Sometimes it be a fast with nothing but fluids. And so when I was talking to God the other day, I asked God why some things are being allowed. And why people going back to the mass? If everybody took the shot and the medical people said the shots were done, why are we going back to the mass? It's been over two years.
And God began to reveal to me. Some things I'm not going to go into detail about. But for many people, when they see those masks, they better remember the Lord. Like Moses had them to lift up the serpent in the wilderness, God did, so that the scorpions would not bite them and consume them. They better look to the heathen, which cometh their help, for their help cometh from the Lord. They better look up to the lifted high and exalted Savior and know that he's able that he rules and reigns above all. They better be reminded of who's in control of this world. They better be reminded of a holy and righteous God that we serve. They better be reminded of the reverence of a God that exists. That he's not in your buildings. He's in your vessels. And as the vessels reside together, it's the overflow of his presence. That he's not in a location. He's omnipresent. And that he's not limited and no power. He knows all things. The seen and the unseen things. And if you think a man it's going to stop anything. You could be at a dentist, have a mask on, and still smell. This is a reminder of the put the blood of the lamb over your doorposts. And know that God is able. This is a reminder to stay covered under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And know that he's able. This is a reminder to obey, obey God for your life. Don't worry about other people's life. For your life. Where he wants you at and what he wants you to do. Don't follow others. See, God told the Israelite to put the blood over the post. If Pharaoh would have put the blood over the post, it wouldn't have worked. He didn't tell him to. You have to be obedient to your God. And you have to know who your God is. You have to know where your trust is at. If your trust is in a man, it's, it's, that's like a chariot and that's like horses. If it's in the name of the Lord, there's a difference. These are serious, terrible times. But God is still good. And his mercy endures forever. And we can prosper. Even in the midst of lack. We can prosper in joy. We can prosper in peace. We can prosper in comfort. We can prosper in strength. We can prosper in knowledge and wisdom and understanding. And love and compassion, and sympathy, and empathy, and know the relationship that we have with God. These are moments to be remembered how God kept you despite of what's going on. How God kept you from seen and unseen. How God kept you despite of medical reports. How God kept you despite of the adversary's workings. How God kept you despite of plans and thoughts. How God kept you continuously before him. 
You better know who's keeping you. God answers prayers. He may not answer them all the way you want them answered, but he answers prayers. Oh, yes, he does. He answers prayers. He answered prayer. And the pandemic, it's just a pandemic. I think this breast cancer week and domestic violence, and that can happen for male and female. But God is a God over everything. Over everything. Nothing too high and nothing too low for God. He's able. He's able. He's able. He's able. Don't ever think that you can't go to God for anything. Even the littlest things you can go to God. He's able. He's able. Mm, 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 mm. Don't allow, don't let despair consume you. Don't let despair consume you. For many in the Bible, they found themselves falling over others' disobedience that God was angry about. And they wanted to warn them that God was giving them the message to warn them. And some was toiling over their own situation. Whatever the situation may be, take heed from the Lord. And make sure you honor God in the way that you should. He's able. He's able. 